Hello, this is Dr. Harriet Fraud on Capitalism Hits Home, an interpersonal update. This is a show about the intersection of capitalism, class, and our personal lives. Hello, today I'm going to talk about the uses and abuses of sex. We certainly have an eyeful of the abuses every day as we watch Weinstein, Epstein, Cosby, and all the other sex offenders paraded across our screens. Now, in order to talk about that, we have to look at sex, which is a psycho, psycho biological phenomenon, because sex is very much a cultural, culturally formed phenomenon. People feel freer and are more sexual or less sexual, depending on what the culture allows. And I'll go over that more as I go. So sex can be an expression of love and intimacy. It can be a way of wanting to please and be pleased by someone you feel very close to. It can be an added area of closeness and sweetness between people. It also can just be an exploration of sensations in a healthy culture like ours isn't. You can have young teens and teens exploring one another's body just to see what they're like and what feelings they can get without a huge cultural religious load on them as they do so. It can also be rape. Rape is a hate crime. The New York State Appellate Court declared rape a hate crime in a recent case because rape requires a total rage at and ignorance of the humanity of one's victim. It can also be a direct capitalist transaction for money, as in prostitution or pimping, or an indirect transaction as in the case of sex for a sales agreement. I had a client who was mandated by the huge hospital complex where she lived to find a proper vendor for their new computer system, which would be a very, very expensive, multi-multi-million dollar computer system. My client went down to Florida, where there was a big tech company that was selling these computers. The salesperson assigned to him was a woman who tried mightily to seduce him in order to facilitate the contract. That is hardly unknown. So sex can be used to enhance a capitalist transaction, as it is often. Or it can be an indirect That's an indirect transaction. It could be a direct transaction. In other words, when Herman Cain, Republican presidential hopeful, was exposed, he was in charge of a hotel chain and had a restaurant chain, a pizza chain. He had a prospective employee who reported that he said, you want the manager job? You could have sex with me. So... That was an obvious capitalist transaction where the perk of sex was added to the attractiveness of this job for a female client. Sex also can be transactional in the sense that Harvey Weinstein tried to portray it. Harvey Weinstein, who in my world happily was sentenced today, indirectly required sex sometimes and directly sometimes. He would say that he wanted to have sex with someone and that was what we did in the film industry. And if this young starlet wanted to break in, that was the required means. So sex there was part of a transaction where the budding actress might be willing to have sex with a repulsive man in order to have a career in Hollywood. 
What's interesting is Rotano, who is Weinstein's defense, said that all these women, actually all 80 of them that have complained, although only um, two were directly on trial with another several testifying about their rapes, but they were beyond the limit where they could have a, a court case. She said that they were all trying to get ahead in a transactional way, that sex was a transaction. She used that word, that they were all using Harvey Weinstein in order to get ahead. And poor Harvey was so attracted to these women that he fell for their manipulations. So that you know, sex can be used in a capitalist context as it is quite often. In the sugar arrangements industry, a growing industry in the United States, where young co-eds have a contract that they negotiate with wealthy men to provide companionship, to provide a GFE, as they call it in the sex trades, a girlfriend experience, where they, when these men are in town, they put other things aside, they go on dates with the men, they go to the men's conferences. A very popular site is Sugar Baby University, where these are all women going through college or graduate school or postgraduate school, and who have a contract to be the escort of a wealthy man when he's in town it often involves going around to a conference where she converses, showing her sterling intelligence, her youth, and her attractiveness as an accoutrement for this man. And he pays for that accoutrement through paying for her tuition, which is an increasingly big incentive for sugar babies, since tuition is ridiculous, and often her rent and other things as well. These contracts are negotiated, and either party can decide to terminate the contract at will. The requirement, which is just an interesting thing for the sugar baby, is never to mention the contract because that would hurt the fantasy of the sugar daddy that this is a voluntary relationship for which he doesn't have to pay. Sex can be a pretext for men to get comfort because within our skewed gender arrangements, a lot of men don't feel manly looking for comfort and soothing and holding outside of a sexual context. S. Ventikesh, who is a brilliant sex researcher at Columbia University, professor at Columbia University here in New York, has found that 40% of high-end sex work involves no sexual intercourse. It involves wealthy men wanting to be held, wanting to be heard as they talk, wanting to be stroked, and wanting somebody who's interested in them or who does a good job of seeming interested in them. And some of the people who are hired in high-end sex work talk about their role as semi-therapists, relieving these men of their anguish and loneliness. Only 20% of the low-end sex industry, prostitution that one arranges on the street, involve non-sexual connection. People's attitudes towards sex powerfully shape what happens in their sexuality, because as I said, sex is a psychophysiological phenomenon. Victorian upper-class women in the Victorian age were not supposed to enjoy sex. That was considered truly uncouth and unappealing and a marker of lower-class status. In fact, Often women arrange for clitorectomies, have their clitoris removed because they were suspiciously sexual. 
and that was a mark of degradation on their part. Also, the mass of Victorian women didn't feel sexual longing or need. Whatever needs they had, they channeled them elsewhere because they were socially forbidden. Lower class women were allowed to be sexual. And prostitution in Victorian England was totally out of control because men sought their enjoyment with a sexual partner who at least feigned enjoyment by paying for it in a capitalist way. Gender training also shapes sexuality. For example, women are taught to watch out for boys wanting sex since they could very easily be labeled sluts by those same boys who use them, that it would ruin their reputations, it would make them ill thought of, and boys are encouraged to press all their neediness, starting at adolescence, into a need for sex, needs for hugs, needs for company, needs for soothing, needs for kindness, start to be repressed by boys at about 12 years old because they're considered unmanly within our destructive gender stereotype. I remember a client of mine telling me that her son, who was four years old, went to daycare and he was wearing these sandals that he really liked. And some other boys said, those are girl sandals, and started teasing him. And he started to cry and say, you're hurting my feelings. These are my favorites. And they made fun of him even more until the teacher intervened. Because they were being trained in a gender stereotype of strictly segregated male and female attire. And if a male ventured into female attire, he was condemned. There's more prestige on male attire so girls could dress more like boys without social opprobrium. Now, why is this? What's going on here? How did we get into such gender trouble? Well, the big theorists whose findings I still find very compelling, two of them at least, are Nancy Chatterow and Dorothy Dinnerstein. Chatterow's theory is that because children are brought up by women, because they're brought up in the matriarchy of dominant female caretakers, whether they're mothers or daycare workers or babysitters or nurses, that they identify femininity as very powerful and that a woman is a power when they're really little. But for girls, their fear of dominant women can be mitigated by the fact that they're women. They know they're girls. From the time you're hot out of the womb, they start saying it's a girl or it's a boy rather than it's a healthy infant. And from then on, the nurses interact differently with the pink blanketed and blue blanketed babies and so on. So girls say, I am the same as these powerful women and I will grow up to be like them. But boys don't have that gender continuity. They don't grow up to be powerful women. So that they often become the not female, the opposite of female, the one who rejects things female rather than identifying as a woman. And in the cultures where men are most absent, often because they can't find jobs to support their families, boys have the most exaggerated ideas of hatred and rejection of women. And that's because they form a negative identity as a way of forming an identity as male. And identities as male or female are basically formed between one and a half and three years old. They figured that out because they had children 
whose adrenal glands malfunctioned, giving them ambiguous gender formation, and sometimes they were brought up as a different sex from their biological sex. And when that happened, they were much more the sex they were assigned than the sex they actually were biologically, and that's part of the presentation as sex as a psychobiological thing. The culture assigned them, so they fit the assignment. Now, Dorothy Dinnerstein's theory is more ominous but similar. She too points out that children grow up in a matriarchy from zero to about six years old when they go to school or when they're more attentive to the culture. Before that time, the powerhouses in their lives are again mothers, daycare workers, nurses, babysitters, who are all female. And so the most humiliating and helpless aspects of their lives are at the hands of powerful women. Now, girls have the possibility of becoming mothers and, and power, child care minders and other powerful women. So that cuts the idea that women are dangerous dominators for women. But men often retain that hatred and that feeling of women as somehow sorceresses, witches, powerful people. And what men fear is being reduced to a nobody in the eyes of a woman. There, were, there was a study that I, I read that impressed me in which they asked men, what do you most fear from women? And they asked women, what do you most fear from men? When they asked men, what do you most fear from women? They said, ridicule, debasement. When they asked women, what do you most fear from men? They said, death. It was very dramatic. And those things are related because most of the men who end up killing women are ashamed of their need for the women they kill. The same thing is true of rapists. And they want to look like less powerful men when they appeal. So Bill Cosby suddenly became very blind when he was on trial. And it was interesting that Weinstein, who went hobbling into court on his walker, once he was found guilty, he forgot all about his walker and walked out of the court because he wanted to seem less dangerous, less like a danger to women, and more appealing and helpless. So that there is this gender dichotomy of what men fear and what women fear. And I must say there is a link between shame at being debased and violence in men. There is also a really important thing in that our culture values men and the male gender much more than women. Starting in middle school, coaches say to boys competing, what's the matter? You're playing like a girl. And then later on in high school, you, what's the matter? You're on your period? <laughs> you know that it's a woman is a secondary creature. And whereas Women are encouraged to be a little tomboyish in high schools. They're encouraged to do some contact sports, to be powerful, to go to the gym, to get toned and, and strong. Men are not encouraged to do those things any more than boys are encouraged to play with dolls, although girls can play cow, cowgirls and have cap guns and be cute. Really quite different. And what happens is that there's, in the male, excuse me, in the male and gender training, little boys are more likely to be emotionally rejected by caretakers. Don't be a sissy. Don't come crying to me. Man up, little boys are often told. 
so they become ashamed of their emotional needs as degrading. Whereas little girls are often encouraged to be able to cry, they're discouraged more from being angry and aggressive, but not from having emotional expression of need or desire for comfort. And so boys do sometimes what two researchers found are the same things that children do when they're neglected. One of the things that children do when they're extremely neglected is they go through three stages. First is anger and protest, loud crying and thrashing around. A second is a kind of stillness and sadness. And a third is withdrawal of emotion altogether. Men who rape women have withdrawn their emotion from those people altogether. And they're, by and large, emotionally very damaged people. And Carol Gilligan and Naomi Snyder did work on that in their very powerful book. So that gender formation and creating a male gender as superior because it's because men are not supposed to be gentle, child-minding, kind, want soothing, and girls are allowed to be inferior, i.e. emotional, is a really important thing. Another important thing is religion, because religion is an ideology that shapes sexuality and has a lot to do with shame at sexuality. The um, correlation of shame, particularly shame for women who are sexual, is carry out in, carried out in all four Abrahamic religions. Christianity and Catholicism, Islam, Judaism, all three really, because we don't have to count Catholic as separate from Christian. It's a branch of Christianity. They all gather together in making women inferior. The Jewish daily prayer, thanks, if it's a man, he thanks God for making him a man. If it's a woman, he thanks God for making her born in his opprobrium, his disapproval. Not so great. In Catholicism, the most holy woman is a woman who never has sex. She just has a baby. And that was brought home to me when I um, saw a demonstration outside of St. Patrick's Cathedral where men who were gay were in a gay chorus protesting not being allowed to be gay in front of St. Patrick's, and they were all draped with condoms, and they were singing, Glory to the newborn king, Mary never felt a thing, which got the idea home that the good woman is one who doesn't enjoy sex. And the prohibitions in all of the big religions enforce that. If you read the Bible, women are always getting sexually humiliated, and that's because Really, what happened was the preceders of patriarchal religions, like Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, were matriarchal religions that worshipped women's sexuality and women's power. Their goddesses were goddesses with huge breasts and pregnant, celebrating women's power to give birth and have sex. And in order to win over those religions, all three religions dissed women in a big way. The next episode will continue this discussion. Thank you for listening. This episode has been brought to you by Democracy at Work. Please support our work. Visit our website at democracyatwork.info.